Hello lovelies, here are 15 words that you can use to help you be student Beth essays up to a grade nine. In this video, I want to give you some crucial vocabulary that you need to know to be able to confidently talk about Macbeth. These are words that you have seen me use a lot in my scene by scene analysis. I sort of realised that maybe it would be useful to collate some of the ones I use most often to convey my thoughts and analysis of character, quotes and themes. It will be a mix of words that you can use when talking about general situations in the play, behaviours in the play, specific characters and their thoughts or specific moments as well. Some are maybe quite complex, but they're not necessarily really difficult or original words. They're words that I think you need to know because they're relevant to talking about really important things within the play. Now, I've tried to create example sentences that mimic the style of writing you might like to use in essays. If you want to practice these in your own sentences in the comments below, let me know and we can check that these all make sense too. So number one, this is one I have used loads in my other videos and it's hubris. You have hubris as the noun and then the adjective form to describe someone would be hubristic. So hubris is the idea of having excessive pride or arrogance, a person with a big ego essentially. It's a person whose overconfidence is actually almost dangerous too. They are blinded by their own ego. We could describe Macbeth as hubristic because certainly by the end, his overconfidence and arrogance leads to his downfall. And don't forget the witches give him confidence with their deceitful prophecies in Act 4, Scene 1. So in a sentence related to Macbeth, we might say, by Act 4, the witches exploit Macbeth's hubris. The prophecies provided to Macbeth in Act 4, Scene 1 leave him believing he is absolutely invincible and cannot be defeated by any growing threat. Now, obviously, that's quite a detailed one. I'm trying to almost show you how you can use this vocabulary to describe certain moments and certain characters as a bit of extra revision for you, too. So this kind of description would work well if you were asked to talk about the power of the supernatural or if you're trying to show how Macbeth changes throughout the play. Number two is turmoil or tumultuous. This one is brilliant for actually discussing lots of different moments in the play. Turmoil just means chaos. If something is tumultuous, it is chaotic. It's perfect for describing the witches, they cause chaos. It's also perfect for describing the chaos Macbeth causes when he disrupts the great chain of being by killing King Duncan. You might even say that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth experience psychological or inner turmoil because of what they've done. So you can see why I've put this one in here. It's a word that will allow you to articulate the consequences of numerous events within the play. So an example sentence for this one might be, Shakespeare foreshadows a play's tumultuous narrative through his choice to open the play with both the witches and thunder and lightning. For number three, we have equivocation. Equivocation is basically when people use unclear or ambiguous language deliberately to confuse someone, gloss over something or conceal the truth. So to be clear, it's not just lying because you're wording something really cleverly, so it's not technically officially lying. This will be because the words you use might have a double meaning or multiple ways of understanding it. So for example, in Act 2, Scene 3, just after Duncan's body is discovered, Macbeth knows he needs to be careful with his words in front of the others. His reaction is this. He says, had I but died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed time. He's saying, if I had died an hour ago, I would have lived a blessed life. Essentially, because he would never have had to be alive whilst Duncan is dead. It's cleverly worded, though, because to the other characters, it's spoken to sound like he wished he didn't have to live to feel the pain of Scotland without Duncan. But to the audience, it reveals Macbeth's inner turmoil and the realisation that he can never escape what he has done. So this is actually an example of equivocation, as he cleverly speaks his true feelings, but in a way where nobody will suspect him. And you can see there how it isn't actually lying. Even more obvious examples of equivocation are when the witches cleverly trick Macbeth in Act 4, Scene 1, making him believe he will be safe unless the forest moves up the hill and so on. Obviously, he thinks that that's impossible, but the way they've worded it means he doesn't consider the soldiers might use it as camouflage. Ultimately, trickery, deceit and equivocation appear constantly throughout the play, so these ideas need to be understood. So finally, in a sentence, you might say this. The witch's equivocation in Act 4, Scene 1 exploits Macbeth's hubris. And you can see again how I've used other words there too. 
for number four, it makes sense to continue with this idea of trickery. There are absolutely loads of instances throughout the play where someone is lying or putting on an act or being careful with their words. This all connects with that huge theme of appearance versus reality, where not everything is as it seems at face value. So my main word here is subterfuge. You might have heard of the word facade or someone being duplicitous, which means two-faced. Someone doing something under false pretense, which just means trying to trick others. Or someone simply being deceitful. All of these are absolutely relevant and some will work better than others, depending on what moment you're talking about in the play. And to be honest, there are probably other words connected to this theme too. A nice one that is maybe a bit more original for you is subterfuge. So subterfuge is when you deliberately trick or deceive people to achieve something. It's like being deceitful. So in a sentence, we could say, Lady Macbeth's clever machination or plan to frame the guards is an act of subterfuge. Number five is the word damned or damnation. If you are damned in some religions, it means you are going to hell as punishment for your sins. So we know Macbeth will experience damnation, as will Lady Macbeth, because they committed what was seen as the greatest sin at the time, regicide. Macbeth immediately following the murder gets our men stuck in his throat, revealing God's immediate rejection of him and also, by the end, just before Lady Macbeth's death, she actually seems to believe she is already experiencing hell and therefore damnation whilst she is sleepwalking. The consequences are essentially inescapable for both of them. Therefore, just as an example sentence, we might say, the consequences for Macbeth are almost immediately felt following the act of regicide, with his inability to pray a sign of his eternal damnation. Number six is regicide. Regicide is the act of killing a monarch. I just wanted to throw this one in quickly, as I know I say all the time when talking about the play. In a sentence, we might say, when Macbeth commits regicide, he disrupts the great chain of being, or in other words, the perceived natural order or state of the world, ultimately unleashing turmoil throughout Scotland. And then seven is the word dichotomy. I found myself saying this one loads in the whole of Macbeth videos, and I love it. It's good for looking at contrast between characters or things. If there is a dichotomy between two things, there is a complete difference between them. They are totally oppositional. You can see this in lots of things in the play. There is a dichotomy between Banquo and Macbeth. There is a dichotomy between Macduff and Macbeth. There is even a dichotomy between the words that characters speak and what goes on inside their heads. Now in a sentence, we might say this. Banquo's caution when confronted with the witch's prophecies in Act 1, Scene 3, contrasts with Macbeth's immediate acceptance of the witch's words, setting up a moral dichotomy between the two characters. And here, I'm just saying that whilst Banquo doesn't trust the witches, Macbeth is enchanted by them. Revealing their sense of morality is very different, because we know Macbeth allows these prophecies to affect him so much that he kills the king to achieve it, rather than just letting fate run its course like Banquo. Now, number eight is the word palpable. If something is palpable, it is really obvious, intense, or impossible not to notice. It's kind of like you can almost feel it. In a sentence, we might say Shakespeare's clever crafting of the moments preceding the murder of Duncan create an almost palpable tension for the audience. This means that the tension is really intense, strong and impossible not to notice. You can feel that tension. We might also say Macbeth's panic and remorse immediately after committing regicide is almost palpable too. And he can't pray or when he says he wishes that the knocking he hears would wake Duncan up. Number nine, we have the word transgress. If you transgress something, you go beyond the limits of it. So typically, this is used for people that go beyond the socially accepted, moral or normal limits of something. For example, Lady Macbeth transgresses her position in society as a woman. She goes beyond the limits of what is socially acceptable behaviour for women at the time. Both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth also transgress the laws established by God when they disrupt the great chain of being. Next up for number 10, we've got quite an easy one, and again, it can be used in lots of ways for Macbeth. The word is whamifications. It's essentially another word for consequences. In a sentence, we might say Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are ignorant of the ramifications of their actions, naively believing they can escape both discovery and damnation. There are situations where this is relevant too. 
You've got the fact that Macbeth can't pray again, the paranoia he experiences throughout the play, seeing everyone as a threat, Lady Macbeth's psychological torment, and the consequences don't just stop at them either, of course. We've also got the far-reaching ramifications throughout Scotland too, with all the strange, unnatural occurrences the characters speak of in Act 2, Scene 4, for example. Number 11 is the word gravity. This is another quick one because I know I said it a lot in other Macbeth videos. The gravity of a situation is how important or serious it is. So quite simply, in a sentence about the play, we might say Lady Macbeth is initially unaware of the gravity of what they have done, as she naively believes the murder can be washed away with nothing more than a little water. There are lots of instances in the play where we can talk about the gravity or seriousness of a particular event. 12 is the word integrity. If you describe someone as having integrity, you are saying they are trustworthy, honest and morally principled. Essentially, they are a very good person with very strong values. So early on in the play, particularly in Act 1, Scene 2, the picture painted of Macbeth is that he has integrity. He fights for his country, he defeats the traitor and does this for his king. This, of course, disintegrates with the witch's words and Lady Macbeth's corrupting nature. We also see characters with unwavering moral integrity. This means they remain honest and loyal no matter what. A good example is when Macbeth, knowing he's about to kill Duncan and worrying about Banquo becoming suspicious, tries to bribe Banquo into loyalty. He tells him that he will be rewarded if he stays loyal to Macbeth, but doesn't give too much away about what that reward will actually be. Banquo says he is happy to remain loyal so long as he can keep his conscience clear. So in a sentence, we might say this. In Act 2, Scene 1, when Macbeth tries to encourage Banquo to remain loyal to Macbeth, Banquo emphasises his desire to maintain his honour and keep his allegiance clear, reflecting his moral integrity. Number 13 is machination. This word is just another word for a plot, a plan or a scheme. Super easy. In a sentence, we might say Lady Macbeth's cleverly crafted machination to frame the guards helps to convince Macbeth that the murder will be seamless. Two more to go. This is number 14, and I can't believe I haven't even mentioned this one yet. Tyrannical. If someone is tyrannical or if you call them a tyrant, they abuse their power through control and cruelty. We of course know that by the end, this is exactly what Macbeth is, a tyrant. You can focus on the ways that people are scared to speak up against him, like the Doctor at the end of Act 5, Scene 1. You can talk about how Macbeth's solution to his paranoia is to kill innocent people. And you can talk about the poor treatment of his subjects and servants. So in a sentence, we might say, where Duncan ruled with humility and nobility, Macbeth rules as a tyrant, instilling fear in his subjects. And finally, we have the word malevolent. This is super easy to remember. It just means someone or something evil. There are lots of evil forces at play in Macbeth, as we know. We have the witches, of course, Lady Macbeth and her manipulative ways, and then certainly by the end, Macbeth, who is willing to kill Macduff's wife and children for seemingly no good reason. In a sentence, we might say, by the end of the play, Macbeth embodies malevolence. He is tyrannical, barbaric, and devoid of human compassion. <laughs> 